Good evening, everybody. I'm Joan Brzezinski, and I direct the University of Minnesota China Center. Welcome to today's webinar, Considering Criminal Law's Role in the Research Security. Thank you for joining us today and for your support of the China Center in this Considering China webinar series. Your generosity makes programs like this possible, and I offer a special thank you to Kaime and Joseph Terry for their generous support of this program. We invite you to help us advance our mission and give to the China Center through the link um, on the webinar announcement or on the website. At the end of the program, we'll answer the questions that you put in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you have any technical difficulties or need help, please use the chat and someone will respond, but please put the questions in the Q&A function. Our speaker today is Professor Margaret Lewis. She's a professor of law at Seton Hall University and her free research focuses on law in China and Taiwan. She's dedicated her legal career to international law, human rights and criminal justice, specifically in China and Taiwan. Professor Lewis has been a Fulbright, Fulbright scholar, senior scholar at National Taiwan University and a visiting professor at Academia Sinica and a public intellectuals program fellow with the National Committee on US-China Relations. She was elected a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Professor Lewis joins us today from Taipei, where she's currently living and working as a recipient of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Taiwan Fellowship. She's authored many articles, including a recent uh, law review article, Criminalizing China. Professor Lewis, welcome. Thank you. For thanks being so here. much. Thanks, Joan, and thanks to Haiyan and to everyone at the University of Minnesota for inviting me. I, I am in Taiwan, which means it's in like the high 60s Fahrenheit and everyone's in puffy jackets. But I was with you where you are, everyone would be shorts and flip flops. And I, I say that being originally from Madison, Wisconsin. So uh, it's, it's great. And I actually spent a number of summers at the Concordia College Language Villages in Minnesota. So it's great to be speaking with you all today. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen and I, um, I promise I will talk uh, no more than 45 minutes and hopefully a little less so we have time for uh, questions. Uh, and I, I'm really, um, really happy to be discussing this topic, which I've been talking about a lot because it is so important. And, and I think it's even getting more important as, as we go on because we're seeing uh, trends that are increasingly concerning, at least from my perspective. And I will today try to give you some reasons why I am and others are so concerned. So as part of the Considering China webinar series today, we're going to consider criminal law's role in research security. Uh, but first, I want to take you back. Um, and um, you might remember they're still around, but they aren't quite so popular as back in the 1990s, the Thai Inc. Beanie Babies, which were going for gazillions of dollars on eBay. And when they were all the rage in the late 90s, I was actually working as a paralegal in the Beijing law firm that was representing Thai Inc., uh, which was increasingly frustrated with the massive counterfeiting going on. Um, and, you know, this sort of how do we deal with intellectual property protection in China. Uh, it got to the point this coincided with the negotiations to have uh, China accede to the World Trade Organization. And actually then US trade representative Charlene Barshevsky was found with too many beanie babies. I don't know how many of them were counterfeit in her luggage um, against the rules the US had in place at that point to try to stem the tide of these counterfeit uh, stuffed animals. Uh, in, in hindsight, this all looks very quaint, right? You know, that this was sort of the intellectual property being protected. Of course, there was also more advanced technology at the time already concerned as part of joint ventures, forced technology transfer, uh, but we're in a very different point today. And I wanna be clear about that, that I um, am not discounting that there are uh, real legitimate concerns about uh, the intellectual property protection needed in the US and in particular concerns about what uh, Beijing and the PRC party state is doing. Uh, so with that in mind, when I was preparing for this specific talk, uh, we just had a jury conviction in a case uh, the, um, and this I want to put out there is, is sort of exactly what the Department of Justice, what the U.S. government should be doing with its resource, resources. So we had the person convicted, uh, Xu Yanjun, who is a member of the Ministry of State Security. This is the hardcore state security apparatus in the PRC. And he was 
convicted of attempted economic espionage. I'll get back to that in a moment. And essentially trying to get people in the United States to steal valuable technology, including from GE, um, some some kind of um, special uh, motor or engine. Um, don't ask me the details, but it's worth a lot of money and um, and important to. Um, the US's um, economy. And here we have a quote from the newly minted Assistant Attorney General for National Security, Matt Olson. He um, was just confirmed by Congress um, and uh, we're really interested, uh, those of us who watch these, to see what he will do. Um, but here saying that this conviction serves notice that the US will not sit by as China or any other nation state attempts to, attempts to steal instead of researching and developing key technology. Uh, and I and I think this is a totally appropriate use of the criminal law uh, when someone has, in fact, tried you know, using money and other leverage to get other people to steal technology. Uh, but I want to com you know, compare the case of Xu with the case of An Ming Hu. So Professor An Ming Hu, a professor at University of Tennessee, Knoxville, he was indicted now, you know, over well over a year ago, and um, for false statements and wire fraud. And the basis of the allegations was that he had a grant with NASA. And on that grant, he did not properly disclose his ties, his affiliations with certain entities in China. Uh, and here we have um, some quotes, um, including from the former Assistant Attorney General for National Security, John Demers, who was in that role before Matt Olson, you know, saying this is just the latest case involving professors or researchers concealing their affiliations with China from their American employers and the US government. Uh, this case went to trial. Um, you know, I want to point out that how the case started was the special agent um, for the FBI in that area of Tennessee had first seen that Professor Hu had attended some conferences in China and initially thought this might be straight up old school espionage. Uh, found out that no, there wasn't enough evidence for that, but kept digging and kept digging for a couple years until we had these charges based on failure to disclose on grant applications. The case went to trial. The jury came back with a hung, it was a hung jury. The jury could not decide. Meanwhile, the defense had said to the judge that these charges were so weak that the judge should intervene and not let the government retry the case, but rather get rid of the case. And then in September, we saw a really um, extraordinary thing happen, a judgment of acquittal. You don't see these very often. This is when there's been a, a jury trial, but the judge says, even viewing the evidence in a light most favorable to the government, no rational juror could decide that the government has proved every element of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. Very unusual. I, I sent this to my criminal procedure students, be like, oh my goodness, there was a judgment of acquittal. You, know, you don't see these very often. Um, and it really shows the judge you know, fundamentally was, you know, having seen this trial, just said you know, no one could come out and say the government had met its minimal evidentiary burden and dismissed all six charges. And these are the kind of cases that really worry me. How did it get to this point? And even though now Professor Hu has been um, acquitted and there are moves to get him reinstated and even some back pay, I mean, the, the suffering that he has endured financially, he's lost his job, even physically, he was under house arrest, you, you don't get that back. So there's huge consequences, even when there is not a, um, an, an ultimately a, uh, a guilty verdict. So all this comes to the China Initiative. This is from the Department of Justice website. You see the big red China. Um, and, and, and I'll explain a little bit about what it is. And, it, and, and because I think the China Initiative is not the only way we're seeing concerns in the US's government, the US government's securitization of the US-China relationship. But it really is uh, the in neon lights, you know, showing how um, I think the U.S. needs to, in some ways, rethink research security, and in particular, um, how we are going to stay competitive in the years and decades ahead. Uh, you might have seen uh, FBI Director Christopher Wray has said a number of times before Congress in the press that the FBI opens an investigation with a nexus to China. Sometimes it's every ten hours, sometimes it's every twelve hours, but a lot. Uh, and I just want to make clear that it, there's it's really easy to open 
open investigation. There's no court review or something. So we really don't know what this means. Um, it shows me that there are more resources being put towards this issue, but it does not tell me anything about whether there's increasing prevalence of illegal behavior. Um, that is something which requires a, a much more difficult study to get a sense. But we certainly see the US government has been taking the concerns about intellectual property theft connected to entities in the PRC much more seriously in recent years. So we go back, so the China initiative began in November of 2018. So it just had its third birthday. I'm not particularly happy about that. Um, and the initial focus was on economic espionage. So we're talking about here, trade secret theft, stealing intellectual property, things that are, um, you, know, you know, like the Coca-Cola recipe um, that companies keep secret. It has value by not having it out in the public. So, but not just trying to take it, but trying to take it for the benefit of a foreign government or an entity closely connected therewith, a business, it could be you know, an academic entity. And we've also seen along with this, um, a much greater emphasis on these non-traditional collectors as they're called. So not your John le Carre Hollywood spies, but rather students, researchers, professors who might have access to technology um, and then steal it, even if they don't sort of fit the old school um, paradigmatic um, spy um, framework. And then we've also seen increasing emphasis on talent recruitment plans. Uh, these are plans put in place uh, by the PRC government. And I, and I often say party state because you have the, the Chinese Communist Party structure and you have the formal government structure. They're closely intertwined. And sometimes these initiatives can stem from the party side or the government side. But regardless, it's essentially the same behemoth. But this idea that Xi Jinping has been very clear and wanting to push indigenous innovation, wanting to attract and create the best talent. And part of that has been putting in very clear economic incentives for people to return to China, um, or if they've never been to China, come to China to do this kind of work. Uh, but participation alone is not actually illegal. Um, great. Okay. So here's my challenge that I want to put out there that, that I and others are hoping we can do a better job of addressing is how can the U.S. government address two real phenomena, the threat by association attaching to people who are viewed as connected to sort of China, um, and then the threats from the PRC party state that, that go beyond traditional spying. There is a there there. And, I, you know, and for me, as a, you know, someone who does criminal law, I always emphasize that guilt is individual. And, and so when you speak in terms of US and China, uh, that makes a lot of sense when you're talking about what's going on right now, for example, with climate discussions that the US and China have, you know, thankfully it sounds like reached an agreement to, to collaborate more or at least um, have some more communication and perhaps coordination. But it's an uncomfortable fit when you're talking about individuals. And so you hear in the US government phrasing under the China initiative, that China itself becomes anthropomorphized that China has stolen a corn seed or it's stolen, you know, Tappy, the robot's arm from the um, T-Mobile, um, you know, uh, factory and China's malign behavior. And, and of course, it's individuals or businesses that are on these indictments, these charging documents, but yet we tend to have now this, this framing that China is somehow stealing things from the United States. And so, for example, this is an FBI publication, China, the risk to academia, you see a lot of these kinds of graphics. Um, and even then, if some of the language is phrased in country neutral uh, language, it's already been very much put out there as uh, China is the threat. Um, and so too, for example, we have um, a number of threat awareness briefings that have been done, threat awareness films, including by the FBI and the National Counterintelligence and Security Center. Uh, there have been uh, a trio of films in particular focused on China. It started with uh, Game of Pawns, which was a uh, reenactment of a US uh, student who had studied in China and, and had been recruited to go back and join the CIA and be a deep uh, spy. Uh, we then had the company man. Um, it was the protagonist was a 
a guy in a, in a U.S. company, you know, no connections to China himself, but was approached by some shady Chinese businessmen with a, uh, a bunch of cash and asked to put the thumb drive into the company computer. Um, and this is supposed to wear raise awareness of the threats of insider threats. And uh, most recently, the Nevernight Connection. Uh, and this is loosely based on a real case, but a retired US military officer who had scientific knowledge being recruited to go to a conference in China and give information. Um, also having lots of stereotypes and tropes of the, you know, the literally the, the cash and the envelope and the um, sort of shady businessman without a clear uh, connection to a legitimate business who was giving him the cell phone, um, the, the bartender who's offering him by Joe. Uh, and, and I watch these and I get really concerned um, because um, it, it feeds, I, I fear these you know, existential threats and these stereotypes um, as opposed to being a clear eyed way of addressing real economic and national security threats in a way that will not fuel bias and prejudice. Uh, in particular, under the Trump administration, we saw some more extreme rhetoric, a lot of emphasizing of the communist and Chinese Communist Party. Um, we even had times where it was the, the uh, instead of the People's Republic of China, talking about the, the People's Republic of China communist you know, government constantly. Um, and then it went so far as when Professor Gang Chen of MIT was indicted for charges that he too had not disclosed allegedly connections to China, a case that is ongoing and MIT is in fact supporting him and paying his legal bills. The then US attorney, the chief federal prosecutor for the District of Massachusetts flat out said, you know, this is not about money, it's about loyalty to China, um, and said this about naturalized US citizen, Professor Chen. Um, and similarly, in these publications from the FBI, they'll say, yes, international students and, and scholars contribute to the US. However, you know, this open environment puts us at risk for exploitation by foreign actors who do not follow our rules or share our values. Some very clear othering. And on top of this, and this was coincidental, but I think it's important that the China Initiative started in 2018, but it's ramping up under the Trump administration coincided, of course, with COVID-19, um, which has had um, such a devastating impact on uh, rising discrimination and hate crimes against not only just people who are ethnically Chinese or PRC nationals, but Asian Americans and Pacific Islander communities more generally. And so that um, was coincidental, but exacerbated some of these concerns. When we get to the Biden administration, and I and others were very hopeful, and I, I continue to be a, a glasses half full, or at least we're going to make it half full kind of person, um, Biden came in and was very clear in saying, you know, we have a responsibility to prevent racism and xenophobia and intolerance. And these comments were made um, in part, in, you know, to refute the sort of, you know, China virus, Kung flu, and again, this sort of COVID-induced uh, AAPI hate. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, um, there is hundreds of years, you know, at this point of history in the United States of Chinese Americans facing discrimination. So this is not new, um, but this flare up has been extreme. Um, he's also stressed that words have consequences, that words matter. Again, going back to talking about the China virus and, and instead Biden emphasizing that it's COVID-19. Uh, and here, you know, I say, yeah, words matter and words matter too in what the government is using when it's looking out there for national security threats. Calling it the China Initiative matters. Um, it spotlights people with ties to China, and it, and it indicates that they are somehow deserving of enhanced scrutiny because of those connections to China. And so some examples, you know, that this, um, my concerns have um, diminished somewhat, but they have not gone away under President Biden, and I'm not going to let them off the hook. So for example, in May, in the press release on the sentencing of a researcher, Song Guo Zheng, for lying on grant applications, it, you know, emphasized fraud, you know, first sentence, you know, a researcher with strong ties to China, um, you know, the Chinese businessman and another one. And when John Demers was still in, again, he's left, you know, and now we're on to Matt Olson, We'll see what happens, but these emphasis on what China cannot develop itself, it acquires illegally through others. This is yet another example of a proxy acting to further China's malign interests. And so this is all kept going. 
and the government, um, and I and I have to say, like, the government is not monolithic. I mean, I, I do, I really believe there's a lot of people who are working very hard to keep the U.S.'s national security and the economic security as part of that safe. And I don't want to discount that. Um, and what I hear again and again is that they're only investigating criminal activity, that so many suspects are of Chinese ethnicity or PRC nationals is because of what they do, not because of who they are. And, and I fully expect that even if we got rid of the China initiative framing, that there would be um, likely a higher percentage of people who are um, charged and convicted with intellectual property theft um, with a foreign component connected to, to China as compared with Chile or Canada or Colombia or pick your country. Um, but um, I am I am concerned about the way in which those cases are being selected and prosecuted because the government is correct in saying that a disproportionate effect that more people who share a characteristic are being investigated, prosecuted, and perhaps ultimately convicted share some sort of characteristic does not alone establish discriminatory intent you know, that they are racial profiling. Um, but that doesn't make everything okay. You know, even, and again, you know, even if the bulk or all of the people in the government are not intentionally discriminating, the more we learn about how bias works, the more that sort of saying, trust us, we've got this is not a sufficient explanation. So why? Okay, so why does it still, so the emphasis on China, again, directs the focus towards people with certain characteristics. We saw this, I think, very clearly in the An Meng Hu case. And we also know there's a lot of anchoring bias that once law enforcement tend to get a narrative, a story in their head, and this is because they're human beings, not because they're um, in law enforcement, it's hard to shake that. So once it was sort of in the head of the special agent at the FBI that An Meng Hu was up to no good, you know, we know that it's hard hard to shake that cognitive um, anchor. And regardless of intentions, again, ramping up investigations while naming it the China Initiative is going to change behavior. And it doesn't make it okay to have this sort of thrown in once in a while sentence saying, no, no, we're really not aiming this at people who are Chinese of uh, Chinese descent. Uh, I think in fact, that serves as a micro invalidation of what their lived experience is in the United States today. It's rational for Chinese uh, scholars, particularly those in the hard sciences uh, and others who are working in science-related fields to be concerned. And, and so just, um, just recently, we saw a big study come out, and this is the report from science, but it's Jenny Lee at the University of Arizona with support from the Committee of 100, and she had fellow researchers that was trying to find out, well, what kind of impact is this enhanced scrutiny having? It's hard to measure. Um, unlike um, me, who I could not do a regression analysis to save my life, uh, <laughs> Professor Lee can. And what was really um, disturbing is, is how the response was that there had has very much been um, an impact on the perceptions of people who have uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese descent and nationality. So here's a few findings that I encourage you to, um, if you go to the Committee of 100 website, you can get the full report. But in particular, when you see this, do you feel fear and or anxiety of US government surveillance? Um, we see that scientists of Chinese descent responded at a much, much higher rate. No, no question this is statistically significant to the umpth degree that yes, um, we feel that surveillance. And in fact, they also feel racially profiled at nearly that same rate. Um, and, and so these are you know, really dramatic results. And, and one thing that really struck me um, too was when uh, the survey went out, it went out in sort of a standard way, it gets blasted out to you know, whatever, a couple of thousand um, or thousands of people, and they got some 2000 respondents, which is, you know, seems you know, a really good pool. But some of the people who received this uh, initial survey went out of their way to find Professor Lee's actual email at the University of Arizona and contact her to confirm that this is a legitimate academic study and not an FBI sting. So we've gotten to that level of distrust um, of the government's intentions. Uh, another one, this is PSYOPs, this is Arizona State. Um, they do a lot of different polling of scientists. Uh, and they did one, this was not specific to people of, of Chinese heritage, um, but finding that, um, that, that there was, by a lot of people in the scientific community, um, thinking about leaving. And um, the US 
response to COVID was part of that. Um, but what struck me was that nearly half of non-US citizens reported considering moving to another country um, in comparison to 35% of US citizens. And more than half say a major reason is they no longer feel comfortable in the US because of political rhetoric. Uh, this was done under the Trump administration. I don't know if they've re-upped it under Biden. Um, but as I you know, said, the China initiative is still going strong. And so I would be surprised if those numbers had changed um, or at least to change dramatically. So, and I've already mentioned bias, but I think this is really important um, that again, that we've got this sense of, you know, just because um, we don't have evidence, nor do I think that the government is going out and saying, you know, give me the list of everyone's name is Chen or John, that, that doesn't mean that everything is okay. Um, that when you put out that we're going, we're really concerned about China and you tell uh, FBI agents and prosecutors across the United States that there's no quota system, but this is really important. This initiative is really important. So you should be looking closely. Um, that strikes me as really worrisome in part because the standards the Justice Department sets for itself. So the, the Department of Justice has a justice manual. This is the manual for prosecutors. It's online, it's been FOIA'd and available through the Freedom of Information Act. And, and part of that is that the prosecutors should not be influenced by a bunch of factors. And amongst those factors, or gender and everything, is a person's race or national origin. And, and so, you know, I take that influence by very seriously um, because influence is not just, you know, sort of those explicit biases against, I don't like such and such group of people, but how our brains work in the implicit biases. And again, I say this because people who are doing these cases are humans. We all have bias. Um, and it's really eye-opening to take an implicit bias test, which, which puts you you know, face to face with how you might have bias with respect to age, gender, um, sexual orientation, um, gender expression, whatever it might be. Um, but what we're seeing, and this is continuing, is that the securitization of the US-China relationship and the dominant national security fo focus of the China initiative is really downplaying that role of unconscious or implicit bias. Uh, and for this, you know, as, as a lawyer and a law professor, I really applaud the work being done by the ABA, the American Bar Association. This is work totally separate from anything to do with the China Initiative. This started long before that, but they have a whole toolkit, it's available online, about how bias affects um, judges, prosecutors, uh, defense attorneys, um, and, and what can be done about it. Uh, and the reality is that, that, you know, sort of two hour training on a Friday afternoon that people have to sit through whatever while scanning their phones is not going to do it, that it is hard work to address bias, but there's a lot of ways that you can make progress, but it, it takes effort, takes slowing down people's thinking, it takes making them understand better how their brains make um, shortcuts. Um, and it also requires um, to be, have real diversity. And I, you know, oftentimes when I'm on webinars and interacting with people um, in the government who have worked on the China Initiative or working on it now, um, it is dominated by white men. I'm, I'm less concerned about the male part here, um, but certainly I think that um, much could be done too to diversify and, and, and bring in um, fresh voices. This has started under the Biden administration. You look at some of the, the high level political appointees and I see greater diversity than certainly we've seen in recent years, um, but more could be done, especially um, in the lower ranks. Uh, and so here too, you know, uh, I want to point the Committee of 100 recently did a study focused just on economic espionage. Uh, and, and so econ economic espionage charges are the most severe charges that are being brought under the China initiative. This is the stealing of the trade secrets or attempted to give to a foreign government. Um, but we've seen, you know, a lot of charges for false statements on government grant forms, wire fraud, tax fraud, failure to file um, that you have a foreign bank account all these other ancillary charges that you did not say when you had to tell the US government that you had connections to an entity in China and you were doing research. Um, and it doesn't have to be um, sensitive research. No one is saying that this has to be classified, just valuable research, valuable IP. I mean, a couple of things from this study, um, it's worrisome, it's still inconclusive because there's a lot that we don't know in large part because the national security uh, overlay on already um, concerns about, you know, not um, 
showing everything that's going on with investigations makes it quite opaque. We don't know a lot of what's happening in the government. So we're doing our best to, to find information where we can. But a couple of things. So I found it really interesting that the Department of Justice publicizes charges against defendants with Chinese names more than those with Western names, um, and by you know about 30%. So again, significant numbers. And so putting out there, and I think this feeds again that sort of we're worried about China and that existential threat. So I think that was one really interesting finding. Another finding I found interesting is that Asian and Chinese defendants were uh, denied bail more often. And here, you know, we need to dig a little bit more. I'm, I'm wondering, if, you know, we it's possible this is explained by factors that are sort of nationality and race neutral. Perhaps they really are more severe charges. It's concern about flight risk that is well-founded. But I, I worry that it might be because of concerns about flight risk, for example, that aren't well-founded, that someone might have some ties to China, but would that really mean it that they could not be released and instead be held um, pending trial? And everything we know um, from uh, lots of studies, again, outside of this context, is that if a defendant is held pending trial, if they're held in custody, denied release, that it has worse outcomes. They're more likely to plead guilty. They're even more likely to get a harsher sentence. And so these raises lots of concerns. Okay, what should be done? I'm about a half hour here. Um, so first, end the China initiative. Stop calling it the China initiative. That is a necessary but in itself insufficient step. But I think it would show the, 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 the recognition by the Biden administration that there needs to be a course correction. Uh, and what is that course correction? Well, to our start, to adopt a country neutral framework for protecting intellectual property that does not accentuate people with China connections. And, and I'll, you know, there are, um, there have been prosecutions that have been put under the China initiative label um, that include people who are white, you know, look like me. Um, but even then, some of the press releases have said things like, and the person speaks fluent Chinese, which makes me wonder, you know, when that is not directly relevant to the, to the crime, why is that connection to China being emphasized in the press release? Um, but I think the more that it can be defining the intellectual property that really is of national security concern and then protecting that from threats wherever they emanate from is what we should be doing. Uh, the DOJ really needs and the FBI to do the hard work of addressing bias in a meaningful way. Again, not just superficial trainings. And this needs more collaboration with AAPI advocacy groups and advocacy groups more generally that, that know a lot about this work, ACLU, Brennan Center, Amnesty, there's a lot of groups that are working in coalition. And then on top of that, deepen outreach with the academic and scientific communities to better understand research practices uh, and building on that base to revise grant reporting and conflict of interest procedures. One of the issues in the An Meng Hu case was that there were unclear rules and also the University of Tennessee had done um, a poor job of, of training and, and supporting about those grant disclosure, initial disclosure and upkeep requirements. Requirements. Uh, this, I'm, I'm glad to say, is um, underway in real time. And so this is just from November 9th. I was like, throw this in the slides. Uh, so at the near the end of the Trump administration, there was a document issued, the NSPM 33, the National Security Presidential Memorandum. And it was about research security and actually a lot of good stuff in there. Um, but it was put out in, in a draft form and the Office of Science and Technology Policy asked for comments. And, and these were just due. So Asian Americans Advancing Justice, APA Justice and others have submitted comments, they're all up on their websites, to try to say how can we put forward the best possible plan for making sure research security is strong without it um, having these, you know, whether intended or unintended consequences on certain populations. Uh, and, and so this is, I think, you know, really important to watch. Um, and, and I'm hopeful, especially because under Biden, the science advisor, um, the head of OSTP, Eric Lander, is now a cabinet level office. We, um, we've seen the elevation of the importance of that role. And, and ultimately, I keep going back to, you know, the goal is to promote U.S. innovation. The goal is not to secure convictions. And for prosecutors, their goal is never to secure convictions. Their goal is to do justice, what, you know, whatever that means. But it certainly doesn't mean, you know, counting how many convictions they, they've gotten. And we need to keep that in mind. And, and so ultimately, we want the U.S. to be in a better economic 
position. And that requires investing in STEM domestically. Um, and it, it also requires both uh, continuing the pipeline of talent from abroad and the talent that is currently in the US that giving that talent every incentive to stay put. Um, there's some great work done by uh, organizations like Macro Polo that's looked at, for example, how talent and artificial intelligence coming from China to the US is hugely important. The brain drain is coming to the US historically, and we don't want that to reverse. And so the concern is that, yes, the China initiative has raised security awareness in the United States. It's raised the consciousness that the open science model that in some ways is so important for the collaborative and innovative atmosphere of the United States um, that comes with vulnerabilities. But the concern is when you have deterrence, when you're trying to stop people from doing bad things, it's hard to do that in a surgical targeted way. To what extent is there over deterrence, chilling behavior that is productive, or is it misplaced deterrence? You know, I think there's still good questions for criminologists about to what extent can we see that the China initiative has deterred the bad behavior that it was set out to stop in the first place. Um, and on top of that, I think, you know, we just have this general erosion of trust. And the, the FBI special agents who are stationed all over the United States, including you know, in, in academic hubs, they rely on that trust to get information. And if people stop talking about talking to them because they're scared, our US government is going to have worse information. And that's not helpful in their jobs or any of our, and I say this as a US citizen, um, security. And even again, Eric Lander, the, the science advisor, he admitted in June 21 to science that it's hard to figure out what you're supposed to be disclosing. So again, we've got this work going on with uh, NSPM 33, and I hope that continues in a robust way because the clearer the requirements are and the less onerous they are, the more you can sort out who has sort of had an administrative mess up or was the classic absent-minded professor or perhaps just was a little lazy or should have done better compared with the person who is surreptitiously hiding things and stuffing money under the mattress. And I'm not saying any of this is easy. Um, it's much easier to say this from my you know, perch in academia and ivory tower, uh, but I do have, uh, I'm very convinced that there's a better way of promoting innovation, protecting national security and upholding civil liberties than the current approach under the China initiative. There's no perfect or easy way, but there is a better way. And here, I just want to highlight a few of um, the organizations that are involved. Um, and, and there's a lot of collaboration going on. Um, so, I'm, you know, I, the, the, you know this, I wish that I wasn't, hadn't been spending so much time the last few years, and even before that, because economic espionage uh, uh, prosecutions with the nexus to China were increasing already under Obama. Those threat awareness films I showed you, two of those were made before the Trump administration. So it was, it was sort of ramped up and put on steroids under the Trump administration, but these concerns are not new. Um, but I have, this is the first time in my career as someone who usually studies China and, and Taiwan, where I've spent so much time with AAPI communities because we are seeing the reverberations of US foreign policy and, and US-China relations um, really hitting domestically in a way that um, I've never seen before in my career. Um, so one silver lining, I must say, I, I just have so much respect and, and so enjoyed learning from these groups. And then some of them have been around a long time and others are new, like Asian American Scholars Forum. Uh, that was put together specifically because of these concerns that have been brought out by the China Initiative and, and, and the predated uh, prosecutions that were leading up to it. Uh, they do webinars on a regular basis. I highly recommend their work. Um, I always feel really um, like um, amazed when I'm on calls with them because it literally will be like Nobel laureates and people who are doing things with gel polymers and computer science um, that makes me realize um, I, I chose right to be a lawyer and not a scientist because they definitely are doing some things that I um, am a little intimidated by. Um, so finally, I want to say if you're interested in my work, um, this is I've, I've written at length about the China Initiative. I did a, a shorter piece for foreign policy uh, this past summer um, about sort of trying a lot of what I've said today, but summarizing that. Uh, and as mentioned, I have a, a much longer, you know, hundreds of footnotes, good old law professor article, uh, also discussing these issues that uh, was published now 
about a year ago are, are finalized. And so it was just when the Biden administration was coming in that I, I tail, trailed off. And there I look much more also at the aspects of this, which is um, you know, about the, the theories of punishment. You know, why, why do we punish and, and, and does the does the China initiative live up to the standards that the Department of Justice um, has set for itself? Um, and my concerns, I have to say, in that article, um, I, I stand by them. Um, they unfortunately um, have been borne out to date. Um, but I do remain an optimist. There is a conversation that is going on with the US government and people outside the government who are critics. Uh, I do believe there are people in the government who are listening. Um, I think changing that behavior is going to be hard. Um, and part of that because of, you know, that you know, inertia and part because of legitimate concerns about, um, about protecting intellectual property. Uh, and I also want to say that in part, it's because of, of Congress, um, that I think the Biden administration is in a position where anything that it does that looks like it is backing down at all on this very, um, national security forward approach to China uh, leaves it uh, being um, called soft on China um, by members of Congress. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I find that unfortunate. And I also find it interesting because uh, while there's a lot of support for the China initiative, simultaneously, we've seen a lot of bills going through Congress in different forms about increasing the U.S.'s investment in STEM, in its, you know, indigenous, our own sort of indigenous innovation, to borrow a phrase from Xi Jinping, but that the U.S. itself needs to be stronger in these fields. So I think that we need to have more recognition that why the U.S. has been strong historically and will continue to be strong is because it has been a place that has welcomed the best and brightest minds, regardless of the passport that body was holding or the physical features of that person. And in order to be competitive going forward, that needs to continue. So with that, I will stop sharing so I can see everyone. And I think I did well on time. <laughs> Yes, you did. Thank you very much, um, um, Professor Lewis. This was very interesting discussion, and I um, I really do thank you for your um, your lecture and for um, your 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 interesting research into this area. Because I think you know the China Initiative, and generally speaking, um, these pressures on international exchanges and research have really I think affected the university community and our campus climate. And that, uh, it's really interesting to hear your perspectives on all of this. So thanks so very much. <clears throat> so we have a few questions. Um, one uh, is Professor Lewis, thank you for your lecture. Would you comment on the types of cases where uh, these faculty have been arrested or are investigated, but not indicted? Um, and the new assistant AG and his review of them, would you um, like to talk about that? Yeah, so when it comes to cases that are investigated but not indicted, um, your guess is as good as mine, right? So this is, um, so the earlier we go back in um, the, the life cycle of a case, the less we know, right? So when there are these investigations going on, um, they are, you know, they are not public. And, and there are some good reasons for that, right? Because if, if the FBI had to put out their press release, but by the way, we're looking at what's going on in this lab, I mean, that lab would be packed up like, like this. And we've had even cases where people have been arrested, you know, getting on the flights. So, but as someone who does work with human rights and criminal justice, I also um, am never satisfied when the government says, trust us, we've got this, right? So we're trying to understand more, where are these cases coming from? And what, what's coming out is, is a lot of this is, is coming from the granting agencies, from the, the, the three letter agencies, the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health. Um, and, and, they're, and they've released some information about their internal investigations, some of which then get fed into the criminal justice system, and how even there we're seeing vastly disproportionate um, investigation of people who are sort of Asian American. And there's different ways, and this gets hard to define. Are you defining it on self-definition based on coding for last names? Um, but anyway, you slice it, you know, that there is more. And, and there again, you ask, well, is it because people 
who tend to be of Chinese descent are just represented at high in numbers. So anyway, you would, you would have a certain, uh, a higher number. And this too is where we need the people who are um, the social scientists, the criminologists to do their best to try to tease out when are these differentials based on factors that we consider legitimate and based on, you know, where we feel comfortable is not being infused with bias and when is it really worrisome and that work takes time now and then on most cases that are indicted are resolved via plea bargains um, and that's a feature of our criminal justice system it's not a bug of the china initiative and so i find a lot of times that i've been interacting through this process with people who for good reason just don't really know how the u.s criminal justice system operates with why would they and and they see the high plea bargaining rate and i keep saying you know over 90 percent of cases plead out. That's that's totally common. But again, at that juncture, very little is public. It's not until trial that you're going to have really robust discovery and learned a lot about these cases. And so that's why like the An Meng Hu case was so interesting because it really was at trial where we saw, you know, the, the FBI special agent who was leading this case and spent literally years um, investigating Presser Hu, uh, you know, he used techniques like Googling, I love Google, I use Google all the time, but you know, I don't want it to be at the forefront. And, and so, um, and even things like uh, when I've interacted um, some, again, some members of the FBI and Department of Justice, very sophisticated, great China knowledge, but in general, the DOJ doesn't have a deep bench on China knowledge and certainly the national security division, it's spotty. So when I'm on a call with someone and, and they can't even pronounce the names correctly of the people that they're not just investigating, but you know, sending away to prison for years, that worries me about general understanding about, about China, about, and just respect for the people who are being investigated. So I think there's a lot of work we could do to put more China expertise um, into this process and trying to build um, that, um, that part of, the, of it up. Um, there is, there has been a case by case review of some sort going on under Biden. We saw the, the there was five cases that were dropped that were actually visa fraud charges, most of them based in the Bay Area. And that was dropped and the, the Department of Justice was very clear that they dropped it in the interest of justice, which is um, what they always say, but on, one was on the eve of trial in part because the length of time the people had been held pending trial was probably not gonna be very different than the amount of time they would serve if they were tried and convicted. So it just sort of, they said, we're not saying we were wrong in bringing these charges, but we just don't think it makes sense to go forward to trial. Um, I think there's some question about that. And likewise, um, but, but differently, there was another case that was dropped under Biden, which was very interesting, the Ching Wong case. So he's a researcher at the Cleveland Clinic um, and you know, very you know, similar to the Ameng I mean, Hu case and, and sort of you didn't disclose when you were supposed to disclose these ties to China. That case was dropped entirely. Like, and so that was a, we messed up and before trial. Uh, we're watching carefully. There's a case right now in the district of Kansas, uh, Feng Tao, Franklin Tao, that is uh, going to trial. It was supposed to be um, being tried right now. It's been delayed to early December. Uh, and a lot of attention is on that because it's it's quite similar. You know, every case is different, but sort of similar as the Ching Wong and the Ameng Hu case. So we're seeing, um, you know, there does the government present evidence that is is, is firmer and, and more credible. Oh, and for Matt Olson, last thing. Um, I don't know him personally, um, um, but I will say that he has a counterintelligence background under Obama, um, and then he was outside the government, um, worked at Uber. And But what, what gives me hope is that he was, on, he was on the board of Human Rights First, an excellent organization that does work. Um, it used to be a lawyer's committee. And, and, and so I am, I am hopeful um, that he will be a more sympathetic to some of these arguments that um, not only is it the right thing to do, to address these issues of bias and, and re um, do a course correction um, and get rid of the China initiative. But also it's the smart thing to do, you know, even for people who maybe downplay the issue of bias, if you want the US to be economically competitive, there's still good reasons to say uh, we need to evaluate this approach. Right, thank you very much. Um, next question, is the level of investigations into China rooted more at the level of commercial activity between the US and China? So a lot more than any other single country, then particularly the behavior of Chinese spies operated by the CPC? 
Yeah. And again, it's hard, you know, I, it's hard putting numbers on this. So I will say, so under Obama, again, we saw there, we saw kind of a, a, a two pronged approach where there was a ramping up of the use of economic espionage, other concerns. There was the, the famous indictment, I think it was 2014 of, of uh, the hacker group connected to the PLA and the indictment that had all their aliases, including ugly gorilla. Right. And, and everyone, I mean, they knew the Department of Justice knew they were never going to get any of these, I assume, guys in a courtroom in the U.S. It was, it was a signaling function, an expressive function saying, we know what you're doing. We're taking it more seriously. But at that same time, while that was going on, you had Xi Jinping coming to D.C. to meet Obama. And as part of the readout um, from that White House, from that, from that state visit, you had and we'll continue to work together to strengthen intellectual property. So you had kind of this two prong, you know, stick, carrots and sticks. Um, and even when the China initiative was first announced by then um, Attorney General, General Jeff Sessions, he was in for a hot minute, and then it was Bill Barr who really ran with it. But when, when it was announced by Jeff Sessions, you know, one of the aspects of the China Initiative, and, and it's not just in the Department of Justice, it's supposed to involve interagency work with the Treasury and Commerce. But one aspect was saying, you know, we're going to encourage China, you know, the PRC party state to do better, essentially, to be. And, and I, you know, I, I always say, like, you know, trying to use this, the China Initiative to have, um, you know, better cooperation and in intellectual property or to deter what's going on by Xi Jinping and company is like taking an ice pick to a glacier. Like, I just don't see that deterrence mechanism. I can see it perhaps on the individual level. I don't want to end up in, in prison, but whether it's going to change the behavior of Beijing strikes me as a, a very difficult causal claim to make. So we saw it. And, and so we do have, we have this cases which have to do with private enterprises. Again, this case that just went down involves the technology from GE. We've seen cases involving Huawei. Um, and then we've got though this much, I think, my sense is, is bigger group of the cases focused on the academic community, the research community, which is less usually about economic espionage and again, more about the false disclosures. And, and I think about these cases either as that the concern is, you know, that there's harm itself in not disclosing because then if you don't say I have ties to China, and you get the money from NIH or NSF, well, that money could have gone to someone else that you, you know, defrauded, you know, you, you essentially engaged in a scheme of chicanery or you know, of deceit to get this money and it could have gone somewhere else. But also more generally that if someone is not disclosing those ties, if they are involved in these programs and they're not telling the US government, then essentially they're almost being primed to down the road be a conduit for economic espionage. So sort of what we'd say is an inchoate crime that it's it's getting people so they might commit something more serious down the line. Um, but these are felony charges. And so even though economic espionage is more time in prison than most of these other charges, it's it's years that could that can be faced um, and decades even um, for issues like false statements. Curious. Um... Okay, so we have two questions and they're kind of similar. And one is, um, what do you think uh, university students can do to help in these issues? And the second would be, what can Minnesotans do to help on the issues that you've highlighted and what types of advocacy or um, you know, reaching out to our US congressional delegation shall we do? Yeah, I, I so appreciate that. So, um, so students, um, you know, one thing that can be done is um, universities, I think, can do a much better job when there are foreign students who come to incorporate them into the university and 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 and, and broader environment. Uh, I first got interested in China, so not because I'm of Chinese descent, um, but rather uh, in 1985 or 84, back in Madison, University of Wisconsin had had a program where they wanted to bring Chinese language learning into one of the high schools and, and Japanese into another, which was which was really quite something for for that time. And they brought over a teacher from Shanghai and she needed a host family. First one just didn't stick. And so she ended up living with my family. And so my introduction was a really, you know, intimate people to people exchange. And that obviously totally changed the direction of my life. So I think that just sort of deep people to people connections is so important. Um, it's not just about this issue, but about US China relations more generally. Uh, one thing I am um, in my peer group who I'm in my 
mid forties are concerned about is I have connections from when I lived in China in the nineties and went all through the aughts with people who they know me. And so they might disagree with me, but you know, they, they can kind of smirk and be like, Maggie, you know, stop it. But we have, um, you know, with, with academics in China and I have those deep ties um, and I'm relying them now to have any contacts, but to build ties now is really hard. And the less that we have people who really can communicate, even when there's differences, the more I worry about the relationship um, just not staying on the rails. So what can you do? You can, you know, Thanksgiving's coming up. Are there any students that need a place to go for Thanksgiving, right? These are small things. But then also, you know, with your uh, members of Congress, as I said, Asian Americans Advancing Justice is an excellent place to go. They're always putting out calls for here's what you can message to your, um, your, your members of Congress for what I think are very, you know, just clear eyed, you know, we need to protect um, the rights of AAPI communities, but also just more generally, um, these principles. Uh, and then, um, and then allyship across the board, you know, that it, this is something where um, these issues should not rest on the shoulders of the AAPI and PRC for national communities. So I think the more that people who aren't seen as just involved because they are directly affected, the more it shows our government that these are issues of wide concern. Oop, you're muted. You're right. Sorry. Um, thanks so much. Um, the Chinese in the United States have become scapegoats through the U.S.-China relationship. Every Western country has a similar program to the China Initiative, but these countries don't have the same issues. People in China, U.S. are competitive, and um, some say Cold War will last 10, 20, 30 years. Do you have any views on this? So I, I don't like the Cold War analogy. I want someone pushes back on that. I mean, in part because I think it's 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 not right. I mean, the, the U.S. and USSR did not have interconnected. Uh, economies. Um, they weren't facing a, um, a real existential crisis of climate, uh, you know, climate change. And so it was much easier to sort of have this Cold War standoff. Um, and here, like, you know, it's just, um, we, I think engagement, that word has been so tarnished as, as if you engage with China, somehow you're seen as um, being soft or even complicit. I don't know. So I'm, I'm saying, you know, we've heard, I say connectivity, um, we've heard competitive interdependence from the Biden administration. Uh, but I think that there needs to be a sense of we need to keep talking. Um, and, and that, again, is important for what I'm talking about here. Um, but also, you know, we need to keep talking so we don't have another incident, um, or hope we don't, like in April of 2001, where uh, the US EP3 surveillance plane collided with a People's Liberation Army fighter jet. Um, that crisis was dealt with and pretty swiftly, it could be um, much worse today, right? We need to keep communicating to have crisis control and to deal with these large issues. Um, and I say that as someone who's perfectly capable of communicating with someone and, and making it so clear that I disagree on fundamental levels. So finding a way to have the, you know, the connections that we need um, for all of our well-being while still putting out there, you know, why I think, and you know, the U.S. has um, a model which is so flawed with, with respect to how our government operates. But in some ways, you know, we it's because the U.S. puts out, you know, shows on our sleeve our, our disagreements, that all of that is out there. And, and this is kind of off the mark, but I have been really worried lately. There's been more talk from Xi Jinping about this um, framing of a, a full process democracy. It's like, like, and this idea that you don't need to have elections for democracy, but that the, the Communist Party, and this goes back to Mao, hears the views of all the people, and then that's how democracy is, um, is, is can be done with less of the messiness of the US. And I just don't buy that. I don't buy that it's democratic in some just different way in China. So I think that also is very much on the US and like-minded Canada, Australia, you pick it to um, to show that democracy works, and I and I say this sitting from Taiwan, which um, had its first direct presidential election in 1996, um, and again kind of gets a little raucous in the democracy sometimes. Highly recommend the uh, John Oliver piece recently on Taiwan, but it does show that um, you know democracy really can work um, to to have people give people I think a, a better and freer life, and that case unfortunately does need to be made right now. Oh, mute it again. Yep. 
I am not zooming very well tonight. Sorry. Um, but thank you very much. We're going to end the program on this note. And um, I thank you everyone for um, joining us this evening. It's been a fascinating look into Professor Lewis' research and into the China Initiative. Um, I also would like to let you know that we will be posting this recording on the uh, website and you can view it there at your leisure at another time. So very much um, really thank you for um, getting up with us this morning and, and wish you a really good day ahead. And uh, thanks everybody for staying with us this evening. Thanks so much for having me. All right.